Today I'm gonna to teach you how to buy an Airbnb step by step. This isn't really planned out, so there's gonna be no fancy editing, no frills, and no non sequiturs that you typically see on the channel. Which by the way, have we ever thought about how awful ducks are? Fun fact, the pet that I wanted growing up when I was a kid was a cow. <laughs> we would pass like a farm like, going, why? Dad, you'll never have to mow the yard again. <laughs> Well, that was fast. I'm gonna try to give you as much detail as possible. With that, let's get into step number one. And that's gonna be setting your goals. So I know that this might seem like very obvious and very like, well, duh, but it, it's really important to have an understanding of what you want out of a short-term rental, out of an Airbnb, before you get into this wild, wacky marriage. Because here's the deal. If you want to quit your job, or if you want to make supplemental income, or if you just wanna have a property that you own, like let's say that you're you know, in Austin, and you wanna own a place in Fredericksburg, which is right outside of Austin, and you just wanna break even, you just want a free place where you can go and hang out whenever you want, like that's a whole different mindset than if you're trying to quit your nine to five job. So try to be realistic with yourself. A lot of people getting into the game wanna eventually quit their job, and if that's you, that's totally fine. But the way that you approach short-term rentals is gonna be so focused on the cash on cash return, whereas if you're trying to buy a place that just kinda of makes money, but you're fine with it because you just wanna use it personally, and in that case, the return might not really matter all all that much to you and if that's true then congratulations like your search criteria is just about to be completely blown open because you're gonna have so many choices when you're not tied to that cash on cash metric whereas if you're trying to make supplemental income you know quit your job you have to really go through your investments with the fine tooth comb so I'm honestly trying to decide if like fine tooth comb was the correct thing to say in that moment <laughs> I legitimately don't remember what the last thing I said was. So we're gonna move on to step number two here, which is gonna to be to nail down your strategy. Now when I say nail down your strategy, here's what I mean. There are so many ways that you can approach Airbnb. You can house hack, where you buy a house and rent out rooms in your house or bonus spaces in your house, or maybe an ADU, and you use that money to subsidize your mortgage. You can also do rental arbitrage, which I talked about a week or two ago. Don't really know when this video is coming out. And that's where you go when you lease an apartment, and then you go and sublease it on Airbnb. Or you can go and buy a second home property with the intention of completely cash flowing, or you can go the glamping route, or you can go the duplex route. I mean, there are so many different strategies that you can implement with Airbnb, and this is honestly one of my favorite things about Airbnb specifically, is that there are so many entry points for every single person out there, no matter what your budget is, no matter what your credentials are, there's always a way to break into the game. And so if you're interested in learning about the top five business models within the Airbnb industry, I've made this handy dandy little PDF right here that kind of walks you through my PO and what I like about each of them. And by the way, throughout this entire video, I'm gonna be linking out to different spreadsheets and handouts so you can download all of those for free and I would highly suggest doing it because it's gonna help you on your journey to finally starting your Airbnb business if you've been putting it off until this video. Okay, so you've decided between maybe renting out a room in your house or buying a house or rental arbitrage or whatever. Once you've done that, you're gonna do something else. <laughs> Right, you're gonna get pre-approved. All right, so this is actually really, really important. So this is something I really want you to do as early as possible. And just in case you don't really know what I mean here, what this means is going to a bank and filling out an application and seeing what you qualify for from a home purchase perspective. Because basically, if you don't know what you can qualify for, then you're gonna be wasting a lot of time. So if you make $40,000 a year, but you're $60,000 in student debt and your debt to income ratio is shot, like mine was when I got out of college, you're not really gonna be able to qualify for a very big mortgage that's going to really dictate you know the rest of the steps that we're going to be talking about today so you really need to get an understanding from your mortgage broker about what you can actually qualify for and just a heads up here most of the time when you're getting qualified conventionally from a mortgage broker they want to see a DTI meaning a debt to income ratio no more than the 40 to 45 percent range so here's how a debt to income ratio works if you make ten thousand dollars a month but your debt is $4,000 a month, let's say it's $2,000 a month on credit cards and $2,000 a month in student loan payments, like me when I was getting out of college. That's $4,000 divided by $10,000. That means you have a 40% debt to income ratio. So in that circumstance, a bank, depending on where they fall in that 40 to 45% range, really isn't gonna lend me much, if anything at all. Now to give you another example, let's say that I had $2,000 in debt and the house that I wanted to buy was $3,000 a month. That would put me at $5,000 a month or a 50% debt to income ratio, and a bank would more than likely send me an email that 
says, Dear Robertito, you are too poor and you're not gonna lend on this loan. Go find a good mortgage broker to answer all of your questions. I like one brokerage a lot. It's David Green's firm. I'll leave a link down in the description for you if you wanna connect with them. So that was probably too much of a tangent, but personally, I think it's very important to understand the mechanics of what it takes to qualify for a loan. And this is why I want you to get pre-approved as soon as possible, because as soon as you have that pre-approval amount, then you can actually go out and make an offer. You can't really go out and make an offer on a house without a pre-approval letter. And you're gonna want that anyways, because what you're pre-approved for is really gonna guide you in step four here, which is pick the market and the reason being is that if you're approved for two hundred thousand dollars then you're probably not going to want to set your sights on los angeles or new york or san francisco you might have to stay in the midwest or some parts of texas or so many other places in the country but effectively it helps you understand where you can and can't buy so when you're picking a market there are four different places that i'm always looking at I like national parks state parks eclectic cities and vacation destinations so national parks and state parks for the most part i feel like that's pretty self-explanatory but just in case you don't know caleb you know leave the definition somewhere on here. When I say eclectic city, what I mean is it's usually a city that's in between two cities or it's a city that is right outside of a very popular destination. Eureka Springs would be a really great example of this. Very eclectic town has a draw to it. People are always going to it. It's got like cute shops and great restaurants and everything like that. Julian outside of San Diego, Fredericksburg outside of Austin, like those types of places. Places that for whatever reason, people just love visiting. Vacation destinations would be like beach towns, mountain towns, lake towns, anything like that, or tourist towns like Hollywood or Orlando, home of Disneyland and Disney World, which is allegedly the happiest place on earth. But let me tell you, I've gone with two kids. <laughs> it was far from a happy time. Have you ever gone to, I mean, like, it's like they, they pitch you on this idea that it's gonna be all magical and you're gonna be on boats and you're gonna be singing songs with freaking Mickey Mouse. But, but really, it's like you're finding like whatever food you can to give your kids. It's like some kind of fried food or some like $18 sandwich. And then it's like, you know, noon comes around and you have to decide, do we stay here or do we go home because it's about to be nap time? And if we miss nap, time, all hell will break loose for the rest of the day after we get home. However, why would we want to leave at 11 a.m. or 12 p.m.? We spent $139 per ticket. It's literally like three or $400 just to have gotten to this point, and the tickets were $300, but the parking at Disneyland was $500. So what are we going to do? So anyways, when you're picking a market, you really have to ask yourself why. Why do you want to invest here? Do you want to invest here because you heard Rob Bilt casually mention it in this video? I wouldn't do that because I was just grasping for straws here on the moment. Do you want to invest in a market because you personally have been there, you like it, you've been a tourist there, and the idea of getting to visit it every so often as the owner of a house in that market makes you excited, then yeah, okay, great. That might be an option. Do you wanna invest there because you have friends, family there, or a random cousin who's willing to be the boots on the ground? Awesome. Do you wanna invest there because you've done a little bit of research and you found out that that particular city is on the rise for short-term rentals and it's gonna be appreciating like crazy over the next 10 years? Whatever reason it is, I just want you to have a why. I want you to pick the reason yourself. I have a lot of students in host camp and a lot of people reach out like daily that's like should I invest here where should I invest and I'm like wherever you want to invest that makes sense for you my job isn't to just handpick markets for you my job is to help you choose markets and understand why that market might be a good idea and how to analyze that market and see if it's a great investment so anyways that's like an unofficial host camp plug again you can go to hostcamp.com and book a call with my team also, when you're picking a market, it would be very ideal if you ran an audit, okay? So go to Redfin, Trulia, Zillow, Realtor.com, wherever you wanna go, and just start looking at houses and see what they cost there, right? So we have a general understanding at this point what you're pre-approved for, let's say it's $350,000. Now I want you to go into that city on Redfin, and I want you to put a max of $350,000, and I want you to see what that actually buys you. Is it buying you a decent house in a decent neighborhood, or is it buying you kind of a crummy place, and so thus, maybe it's a better idea to go and find a different market. You know, you have to go and run an audit and understand how far your money will go in that city. And then while you're running your audit, I want you to go and research the short-term rental laws and regulations and see if Airbnb is even legal there. Because you never really know. A city could be totally for it or totally against it. Either way, you're gonna have to do a little bit of research. Moving on to step five here, and I'm pretty sure I didn't even say steps one through three. I just started at four. This is step five. Once you've picked your market, you're gonna move into finding a realtor. This is really one of the more actionable and tangible steps that you can take. First really big one being getting pre-approved and then finding a realtor and with these two steps you can literally go out and make an offer now, I want you to go out and do everything that I'm showing you here but finding a realtor is very important and ideally you want to find a realtor that understands short-term rentals I usually call realtors and I interview them a bit and I throw them softballs and curveballs and I'm like yeah so do you invest uh, do you know what Airbnb is and if they're like yeah I think I've heard of it and I'm always like yeah okay thanks for your time oh how do you not know what Airbnb is <laughs> hey Right back at you, bitch. 
No, 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 I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. But if they don't know what an Airbnb is, then I'm probably not gonna use them, okay? So it's very important that you find a realtor that at least understands like the concept and like the perimeters. If they're an actual investor themselves or if they know people with Airbnbs, this is just gonna be really huge because they may then be able to actually give you anecdotal evidence or POVs or insights into the actual market that you're trying to buy in. Now, I know that finding a realtor is very difficult and let's just say that, you know, homeboy over here is working on his realtor's license and if you wanna find a realtor that specializes in short-term rentals, or if you need a realtor at all, I finally have a system in place where I can help you do that. I can connect you with the realtor in my network anywhere in the country. So if you want or need someone that specifically specializes in short-term rentals, send me an email to this email right here, okay? And I'm also gonna leave it in the description down below, and I'll get you connected with someone who can help you. Anyway, however you decide to find your realtor, it's very important that that realtor gets you on a list. And what I mean by a list is they get you on an auto-generated list that fits your particular criteria, the bath count, bed count, square footage, price, whatever that is. And then anytime a home within that criteria hits the market, it'll automatically send you that listing to your email. Okay, step six here, I want you to spy on your competition. What I mean by this is I want you to go to Airbnb and start looking at the neighborhoods that you're interested in buying in and start just doing a competitive audit on how well your competition's doing. So let's just say that you find a specific neighborhood and you're interested in buying a three bedroom, two bath, go into the Airbnb filters, put in three bedroom, two bath, and take a look at all the listings that pop up that might be similar to yours. And start just looking at their interior design. Uh, generally speaking, in this neighborhood, are people pretty good at interior design? Do they have great listing copy? Do they have great photos? Everyone in this neighborhood just a complete design nerd and you're not really much of a design nerd and maybe you can't compete with all the awesome hosts in this neighborhood, so thus, maybe you wanna invest in a different neighborhood or does everyone suck? You know, this happens all the time. Did people take photos of their listing with the potato phone and thus, all you have to do is come in and take professional photos and, and just buy furniture that's not from Goodwill and if you do those two things, you could be the king or queen of that neighborhood, right? So doing a little bit of research, spying on the competition, seeing how well they're doing, looking at their calendar, seeing how booked out they are, how much money they're making. This is going to be really, really helpful for you in determining this is an area you want to invest in. Step number seven. Okay, we're going to speak about step number seven in this whole entire process. Still deciding what accent that was. But step number seven is analyze your deals, okay? I'm not really gonna go into super detail into this because I actually have an entire video that's overlaid over my face right now where I actually go super in depth on how to analyze. I'm just realizing that this is a very awkward way to hold my hands. But what I want you to take away from this step in this video is that I think that you should really learn and master the art of comping Airbnb deals, okay? When I say comping, I mean pulling up comps, seeing how your competition is doing. To me, this is by far the most important skill you can have as an Airbnb investor, host, entrepreneur. I really do hammer this process over and over and over again in host camp. Really just drill this into my student's head, like how to do this because it can make or break the deal, right? It can really determine if your deal is a 10%, a 20%, a 30 or 40. I had someone that came to me with a 50% cash on cash deal and they said, do you want to partner on this? I was like, heck yeah. But then I ran the deal with them and it ended up actually being like a 10 to 15, maybe a 20 in a perfect world. And I just walked through the process with them. And I was like, you're missing this expense, this expense, this expense. Have you looked at this? Have you seen that your competition is doing this and you don't have this, right? So it's like a whole process that it's very nuanced and it's very important to just sharpen the skill as much as possible. Again, my other video on analyzing Airbnb really goes into depth here, but I want you to do this 30, 40, 50 times. I want you to do it 10 times a day, 20 times a day until you're comfortable enough to make your first offer. Boom, you've analyzed the deal, you're ready to go. You found a cutie, you found a little croissant. Boom, you've analyzed 50 deals. You finally found the one. You said, Rob, I've done it. I found the one that comps out at 21%. But if I really knock it out of the park, it's gonna be at 25 or 30%. Now what? Okay, this part is crazy, all right? So I just write this down. You're gonna make an offer. Oh, what? I'm gonna make an offer, but it's so scary. It's becoming real, Rob. It is becoming real. And here's the cool thing. Making an offer is pretty easy. Your realtor really does all the work and then you sign the paper, right? Make sure that you understand the terms. Make sure that you understand the contract, that your realtor explains that to you. And I'm not saying go out and make willy-nilly offers, but if you go and you make an offer and it gets accepted, there are certain opportunities for you to walk away and still get your earnest money back. Now, understand what your contract says. It's gonna be very specific to your state, but it's not like if you make an offer, 
That's it, you have to buy it. You have to buy it right then and there. I walk away from deals that I'm in escrow on all the time. It's not because I want to, but it's because maybe I uncover something during due diligence, maybe the inspection came back bad, maybe the appraisal was right under, and I was able to walk away from those deals, and I was still able to get all my earnest money back because I had things in my contract that allowed me to walk away from the deal. So let's just say that you make an offer and it all goes super well, inspections were great, you negotiated with the seller, maybe appraisal came in just a hair higher than the offer that you put in, and all is good and great. Should take you about 45 to 90 days to close on the loan, sometimes sooner. We actually made an offer on a place last week and we're actually getting funded on it in like the next week or two. Super fast, gonna probably be the fastest loan that I've ever closed. And then I've also had stuff that's gone out like 120 days. So just be prepared here and just understand that your mileage may vary. Moving on to step number nine here. I don't even know if I said step eight on the last one, but no, it doesn't matter. Step number nine here is gonna be to remodel and furnish. Now you may not be remodeling at all, but maybe your place needs a little TLC, a little tickle, a little laugh, and a little cut. Cuddling. You might need to go paint the walls or rip out the carpet or change out countertops or remove bodies from inside the wall, like whatever that ends up being. Set, set your budget from the beginning and make sure that it falls within your overall budget and however much cash you have in your bank account and that you're comfortable with making the investment in your remodel. Now for me, when I'm seeking out Airbnbs, for the most part, I'm trying to spend like five to $10,000 on remodels max. I'm trying to get more turnkey houses these days because I just don't have the time to go and put the sweat equity into it. But you starting out, for you to get a really great deal, you might have to go and do a little value add. So you just have to factor that into your budget. Then you also have to furnish it. Now furnishing is its own topic as well. And I have an awesome video on this. This is actually one of my favorite videos I've ever done. And I think it's a crowd favorite too. It just walks you through the entire philosophy of furnishing your place, okay? But since I cover this in depth in this video, I'm gonna keep moving on here. But I will say that you wanna budget about $10 a square foot minimum to furnish your place. So if it's a 2,000 square foot place, it's gonna cost you about $20,000 to furnish. Now for me, I do have some bougie champagne taste. So I'm usually going to be in that 10 to $15,000 range. So if it's $15 a square foot and it's a 2000 square foot place, it could easily cost me $30,000 to furnish it. Most of the time I'm falling in between though. But if you want help staying in that $10 per square foot range, I have a full furniture list, like literally everything you could possibly buy, everything you possibly need for an Airbnb, put it together in a free PDF. You can have that too. All you have to do, click, add to cart, buy. I've done all the hard work for you. It took me many, many, many hours to put this list together but I use it for all of my Airbnbs. So go forth, get those credit card points, furnish your Airbnb, and you know, you're welcome. <laughs> That's it, <laughs> you're welcome. After you've done light renovations or you remodeled it and you furnished it, the place is ready. It's ready to go. Oh my gosh, we did it. We made the offer. We closed the place. We've remodeled it. We furnished it. We're to the finish line, right, Rob? Well, not, not really. Not quite to my tempo, no. Honestly, I think if you've analyzed it, you've gotten it under escrow, you've closed on the house, hard part, is that over? But like half of the hard part is like done. But now we're moving more into the Airbnb side of things, okay? So once it's furnished, you're gonna hire a professional photographer. I cannot tell you how frustrating it is when people ask me to review their listing or give them feedback or advice on their Airbnb listing. And the photos that they've taken on said listing was taken on the freaking Blackberry from 1993. And I'm like, dude, why would you spend 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars on furniture and 40 to 150 thousand dollars on a down payment, but you won't spend 150 to 800 hundred dollars on photography to make your place sing. Oh, that was stupid. Oh, I hate that that's even in here. Well, to be fair, it is like 1045 at night. Haven't recorded a video this late. It's been a while. <laughs> Moving on. Hire a professional photographer. I mean, really, if there's one thing you take away from this video, please just pay like 500 bucks for a photographer. I promise you that my ear itches. And I also promise you, all right, that it's worth it. I promise you that if you have great photography, it's gonna pay for itself over and over and over again. There was one time I took cell phone photos and then I replaced them with real professional photos. And then literally like that same day, I got four requests and then the request that I took turned out to be a $10,000 request over three months. You just cannot beat the ROI on great photos. A lot of my listings are in Southern California. If you're in the Southern California area, I highly recommend my good friend Barker Studios. He has literally like, I attribute a lot of my YouTube success to to him. I'm gonna uh -uh. settle down. No way. Uh-uh. Get mm -mm. in the back, please. Boo. 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 
He took this photo of Conejo, which was a thumbnail for the first YouTube video of mine that ever just went truly viral and just completely blew up. And then my whole platform grew as a result of it. Now, obviously I think the video was probably pretty good too, but I mean, a good photo could be a reason you cry or smile or laugh about a memory or the reason you click on a YouTube video like my thumbnail videos or the reason you spend thousands of dollars to book an Airbnb or the reason why someone else spends thousands of dollars, if not tens of thousands of dollars on your Airbnb. So really just spend the money here, okay? Or else I'm not gonna let you watch this channel anymore. Anyway, moving on to step number 11, once you have your pro photos, guess what you can do? You can actually make your listing. Make your listing on Airbnb, okay? Upload those photos, write good listing copy. This is more important than ever with all the Airbnb changes and the redesign of their website. Get those keywords in there that really will help you rank for all the different categories on the Airbnb website. And yeah, just like put a lot of time and energy into making sure that you razzle dazzle people with your Airbnb listing. And guess what? I have five amazing tips for you in a handy dandy PDF. What? You have so many PDFs, Rob? Yeah, you're welcome. I make these to help people because I just want to see you succeed. So you can download that for free and it'll give you my top tips, which was actually my nickname back in high school. Anyways, it'll give you all my top tips on how to have a great Airbnb listing. And while we're at it, since you're here, if you sign up with my Airbnb link, you'll actually get $75 when you host your first day on Airbnb. And guess what? I'll get to be your Airbnb ambassador. Isn't that cool? We'll be connected in a cool, small little way and you get 75 bucks, of which I'll expect you to Venmo me half because, I mean, it was free money anyway, so it shouldn't really be a big deal for you to give me half or honestly 90% of it because if you still took 10% of it, that's 750 that you wouldn't have made either way. So anyways, I'm getting tired. We're gonna wrap this thing up. Well, kind of. Shoot. We got so much to go. I was like, I'm gonna knock this out in like 45 minutes, but when you're wrong, you're wrong. Okay, I have these broken out into two different steps, but I think I can kind of combine them. We'll just say steps 12 and 13 is setting your pricing strategy and setting your automations. Now with your pricing strategy, it's gonna take a while to perfect this. It usually takes me about three months to really settle on how much I'm actually charging for my Airbnb. Typically, starting off small, as I gain more reviews, I increase the price, and I use an automated pricing software called Price Labs, which is basically dynamic pricing. This means that depending on the market supplier demand on any given day, they have a very fancy schmancy, very very um, smart <laughs> algorithm. It determines the best price point for my place compared to all of my competitors. And that's honestly relatively inexpensive and it's completely automated. So I really like the software and if you want $10 off your first month, I'm gonna leave a link in the description for you. Um, also, spoiler, I'll also get like a little, I think I get like 10 bucks too. So tell you what, if you sign up with that link, I won't make you Venmo me half of that $75 from signing up with my Airbnb link. All right, we're even now. Step 13 is gonna be setting your automations. I actually have two videos on this that you can go and binge right after this. One I think is called How I Self-Manage 10 Airbnb Properties Without Living in the Same State. The other one is called This is Exactly How You Self-Manage a Property and Why I'll Never Hire a Property Manager. They're both good. I really like the Why I'll Never Hire a Property Manager one because it really just gets into some of my more up-to-date philosophies. But for setting automations, I really like Guesty for hosts. And when I say setting automations, I mean automating my communication, like all of my messages, so that whenever someone books my place, I don't have to send them a message that says, hey, thanks for booking my place. I have a software service that sends that out or they'll send them check-in instructions or checkout instructions on my behalf and it helps make Airbnb a little bit more of a passive investment for me. You can also automate all the scheduling with your cleaners. You can also automate leaving reviews for your guests and asking for reviews. There's so many things that you can automate these days that really, I mean, it makes your job as an Airbnb host a lot easier. Again, I use Guesty for host. That's ideal for people that have four or less listings. If you have more than four listings, they have a fancier version called Guesty for pros. But if you're interested in using them, which I use them by the way, you can get two free weeks when you sign up with my link down below. Let me just say that I understand that this video is like, hey, uh, use this link or this link or contact these people or here, download this or download this. Like all of this is stuff that I've been compiling for literally two years. And it's just like my catalog of stuff that I give out to people to help y'all. And obviously it helps me because then you're like, man, thanks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna like your video which obviously you've done now. And maybe if you liked the video at the very beginning and you're like, well, how can I continue to support you? Drop a comment, hit the notification bell, hit the subscribe button, whatever. <laughs> I'm not gonna beg for it, please. Ooh, speak of the devil, I just got a $985.52 inquiry on Airbnb. Okay, step 14, after you've set all your automations, you're gonna assemble your dream team. This is gonna be hiring your cleaner, making sure that you can find someone trustworthy that's gonna show up, make sure that it's clean by 4 p.m. when your guests are checking in. You're gonna hire your handyman, very important person that you're gonna wanna have on your roster because they're gonna come and fix things when they break. Ideally, the cleaners communicate with the handyman and they can help automate that further for you. A lot of the times I've gotten really lucky and my cleaners have actually been 
married to my handyman. And that's really the greatest situation ever, but that's probably not gonna be the case for you. So just find someone that's reliable. It's nice to have a, a roster of people that you can just call because handymen don't always answer. So if you could have like two, maybe three, then you'll always have someone that you can call. You'll also need to hire pest control because we don't like roaches or mice in our Airbnbs. I've had it all. I even had a bed bug like two weeks ago and then it turns out that it wasn't a bed bug, it was a bat bug. We spent $1,200 on the wrong procedure because we didn't even have bed bugs. Oh man, it was a whole thing. It was a whole thing. Outside of pest control, a good contractor would be someone to have on call too. A pool service and lawn service. That's your Airbnb Avengers. So to recap, cleaner, handyman, contractor, pool service, lawn service, and pest control. So that's six people. I mean, the pool service, obviously, like you don't want like a, a, a hot pool guy if you don't have a pool. Well, actually, maybe you do. I'm not here to judge. Anyway, that's gonna be your dream team. Interview them, you know, re really put them through the ringer, like ask them questions and see what their process is and how they do things. The cleaner out of all these is the most important though. So but really I try not to negotiate with cleaners too much. Whatever rate they say, for the most part, I'm gonna pay it because a happy cleaner will leave your place cleaner and thus make you more money because you're gonna have better reviews and people booking your place more because the reviews are good. And once you found your golden unicorn cleaner, you can get them all set up on CoKeeper to go that extra mile to make sure that your place is being perfectly maintained and well kept and well cleaned. Oh, we've done it. We've gotten to the last step, which it's like not really, but for the sake of this video, it's the last step. And this is gonna be operate and optimize, okay? You've listed it, you've gotten the professional cleaners, you have your dream team. Now it's time to launch, like go live. It's not gonna be perfect, all right? You're gonna have a couple of hiccups, might have some failures, you might have some wrinkles that you have to iron out. The first three months of your listing are so crucial because this is where you're gonna be really just optimizing everything. You're gonna be leaning on your guests to tell you what wasn't perfect, and it's gonna be on you to correct those things, okay? So a lot of people try to launch with a very perfect Airbnb. It's just not gonna happen. You're gonna miss something. I miss stuff all the time, all right? I'm very honest about this on the channel. Like, I mess up all the time, guys. The reason I can come onto YouTube confidently and then teach all my students confidently is just because I've done this for so long that, yeah, I still make mistakes, but I learn from them very quick. A bad host never learns from a mistake. A good host is happy to have made the mistake so that they'll never make the mistake again. Embrace failure, my friends. It's fine. It's fine to fail because we do not become Airbnb experts from everything going right. We become Airbnb experts from everything going wrong and then we learn from it and we get better, okay? So operate, fail, make mistakes, optimize, and if you do that, you're gonna be just fine. Anyways, that's it. Um, I hope this was helpful. I'm so sorry if it seemed rambly, but he, that's who I am. At this point, if you don't know that, then I mean, it's, it's kind of your fault. Like if you made it to the very end of the video and you're just now realizing like, oh my gosh, you rambled the whole time. Like I didn't ask you to stay. Well, I probably did, but I didn't make you stay, but that's it. That's the tea on buying your very first Airbnb, step-by-step. Step. Obviously there's so much that I left out here because it's a YouTube video. But again, if this video wet your whistle, which is, you you know, just the weirdest phrase ever, and I've never used it before up until this, ooh, man. <sighs> you guys ever breathe a little bit and then your heart hurts and you're like, you gotta wait it out? One second. Like my whole childhood, I thought I was the only one. I was like, man, there's something wrong with me. And then when you get older and everyone's like, that happened to me too. And you're like, and then you get older and you're like, I'm not dying and I'm not alone. Anyways, moving on. If this excited you and you wanna learn more and you desperately wanna get into the Airbnb game, but you just don't know where to start or you don't know how to scale or you don't know what to do, then again, you can consider joining Host Camp, my 12 month mentorship program. I've got over 15 hours of content there. I do monthly coaching calls. We've got a very active Facebook community. If you wanna learn more about my program, you can go over to hostcamp.com or you can click the link down in the description below. And again, big thank you to today's sponsor here, Vacation Rentals. Always appreciate your support, my friends. And I will catch you on the next episode of Row Built. <laughs> nah, just kidding, it's Raw Built. I don't know why y'all still say Row Built. It's obviously Raw Built. I've been saying it for two years. Uh, I digress. All right, see you guys.